Sana, uh, tell us something about this this project. How how did it come about? <laughs> Well, the movie that you have just seen is our pizza session. We lured a group of high school students to the Royal Library in The Hague, and uh, uh, while promising them pizzas and giving them pizzas, they tested our prototype. So at uh, the start of this project is uh, medieval memes. Maybe you know it if you're an active Twitterer. You cannot have missed <laughs> this, uh, this internet hit. Who um, knows the... the Medieval meme? Yes. Yeah, you see. Oh, ah. right. Everybody. Almost Don't everybody. have to explain anything about <laughs> this. So um, I was um, connected to this project via Twitter. I'm an art historian, so the people of the Royal Library asked me, can you cooperate in this project? And I thought, oh, I love memes, of course. Mm. So um, the Medieval Meme Project was a great success. And um, um, after that, uh, we were thinking, okay, how can we you know, profit from what we've learned in this uh, in this medieval memes uh, uh, generator thing, which is for the people who don't know it, you you can uh, take a miniature from the collection of the uh, KB medieval miniature and put uh, your own uh, text on it. So I was standing at Hoge Woerd, uh, I think an hour ago. <laughs> so I posted a meme on my Twitter account to reflect <laughs> on that, to reflect on my mistake. <laughs> so I think there are two things that were a success in the medieval uh, memes generator, and that was the appropriation of uh, heritage. So people could transform it into their own world. They could uh, give it their own uh, uh, meaning. And that was something that we wanted to work with and th that we wanted to you know, reuse. And then we um, transformed it to the project Medieval Me. And Medieval Me is a serious game um, that high school students can play uh, during their history class. And there are two things that are important in that game. It's a, it's a science communication project. We want them to, um, to understand how important interdisciplinarity is, working in an interdisciplinary team. And the second thing is that we, we want to show that science is not only about um, uh, 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 maths and, and, um, and chemistry, and but that we as humanities scholars are also scientists. So, and, and um, the idea of that game is that we um, take um, a, a medieval manuscript and we transform it or we put it literally in their classroom. So, in augmented reality, they can play with it in their classroom. They can give it their own, um, uh, uh, they can give their own interpretation to it. So, they transform to scientists, work together and uh, create something with that manuscript. So, so the idea is also to change their idea of what science is and what a scientist can be. Yes, absolutely. And um, when we are talking about public, it's, it's also interesting to think who are we aiming at. So yes. we decided that this project is not only for the uh, VWO, so for, I don't know what the English translation is of that. One. So preparation, like preparation for for university. School. Secondary, so yeah, secondary yeah, school, grammar, grammar school is that like the higher college, well the high college, college yeah. preparatory yeah. secondary yes, school. Thank yeah. you, thank, thank you, you for Joel. that. But <laughs> we want to aim at the whole range of um, of secondary school students, of high school students. So we are also taking the VMBO uh, students in the Netherlands because we think that it's important that everyone sees that they can be a scientist and that everyone. Um, um, learns that certain, you know, threads that they have. So I can think, or I can cooperate, or I'm a really good a drawer. I can I can draw things. That that's something that can make you a scientist, even if you are, you know, in another school level that doesn't train you to go to university. Mm -hmm. So uh, before you try to reach your audience, I think you 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 want to know who they are and and what to need uh, what they need. And I think you have. Uh, two publics here because you have the teachers, of yeah. course, yeah. and uh, the students. How yeah. did you get to know them and 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 what they needed? Yeah, well, we uh, we worked together in this project with Doyle. W that's a that's a design um, um, bureau that also created the meme uh, generator, and they work with what they call or what they call what's called design thinking. I don't know if you know that. It's a Silicon Valley um, a thing where you in five days um, identify a problem. And in the end, you develop a working prototype. I didn't know it, so I, I just went in knowing nothing. But what I found the interesting thing is that we started with interviewing teachers. So, you know, 
do you see the same problems that we see? Yeah. Because I can think, well, it's important that you know what interdisciplinarity is. But if the teacher said, oh, we are we are covering that, you know, yeah. we're we're okay, then nothing happens. And in our project, we constantly have those design thinking sessions. So we're constantly constantly in conversation with teachers and with students. And that's what you saw here. Yeah. A group of students who are just playing with our prototype while eating pizza and giving us very, very important information. Yeah, so there's this process of, of constant testing. Uh, yeah, your, yeah. Your we're constantly well. testing. Is it what we are doing? Is it okay? Does it still fit the need of the uh, of the public? And when, when are you satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> I'm satisfied if we can build a cool game um, uh, and if we have um, uh, students who are advising their teachers to use it. So that's our goal. If we can develop something that a 16-year-old will take to their teacher and say, okay, we want to do this, this is cool, then I'm, then I'm done. So then I can stop working and sit, sit, sit down. And um, we're trying that by using, uh, for example, social media. So we're trying to, you know, to lure them via Instagram or TikTok or stuff like that. To um, to to show that this is cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're full. Uh, this this room is full of people from the humanities, uh, uh, of course. Do you, do you think that 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 the humanities are are lagging behind when it comes to public engagement? Yes, activities. I, I do. Um, sorry, guys, but if <coughs> we look at the betas, if we look at naturalis, uh, at Nemo, at we should do better. We should do better as the humanities. I'm, we are we are doing it already, and we have all kinds of cool projects, I think, but we lack the ability um, as as a as a group to say, okay, you know, we are science too. We do public engagement, and you know, people say, yeah, I'm making I'm I'm making an, an exhibition. Well, that's public engagement. You have to and you have to advocate that, and you have to. Um, to put that um, uh, opposite to, for example, projects that um, that from uh, science are being developed. For example, my I have a kid, I have an eight-year-old kid, and three weeks ago a truck came with a with a satellite on it or a rocket. I don't know what it's called. With a rocket, so the <coughs> kids had a six-week training to be an astronaut, and then they could go into that rocket with their VR glasses and have a space trip. We should do something like that. Why aren't we doing that? You know, that and and then we say, well, people say that we're having a hobby. Yeah, because we're not showing what we do, what questions we ask, and and we should improve that. So it's it's also about being less humble, maybe. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Joel, maybe you want to respond to this. Do you do you agree? No, I, th I think actually much of the problem is that we need to be more humble and more right. willing to learn from the perspectives of. Uh, folks outside the academy. I mean, that's you know that's one of the things we saw in the last uh, last presentation, um, and I think it's it's challenging because you know we're trained and we're socialized to be always pushing for the most sophisticated uh, analysis of something, the most um, you know finely articulated formulation of our ideas, and so on. And so we're not we're often kind of like oriented in a direction that that's sort of designed to make us relatively inaccessible. Mm -hmm. And so shifting gears on that is 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 hard. I think that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of room for for improvement, but I would put it more in terms of realizing how much we have to learn from from other perspectives and it's not just a matter of sort of getting a more more sexy packaging for the messages we're pushing. Mm but it's also creating context in which there's a genuine, a genuine dialogue. Um, you know, it's not gonna be the same as talking with colleagues who are at a similar level of expertise, but I think thinking in a creative way about those contexts of mutual learning is really important. What do you think uh, about that, uh, Sana? Well, I, I agree, I agree that, and I agree that um, um, that the conversation with our public is key. So we have to, you know, ask also to our public what what do what do you want? But I I think that it comes from the individual researchers. But to institutionalize institutionalize it more could could help, you know, and. Um, uh, if you, for example, I'm an art historian, so if you look who is doing science communication in art history, well, it's the Rijksmuseum, of course. 
But if you look, what are they doing? They're constantly only the only thing they push is Rembrandt, 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 Rembrandt on the television, mm -hmm. on the. Yeah. So and and that is not science communication. That's marketing. That's marketing yeah. your own collection. And I I love the Rijks Museum. I love what they're doing with Rembrandt. But from I think from the academic perspective, we would thrive if we could make that picture much more broad than only for, in my case, 17th century art. Joel? Yeah, so uh, I think this is a really important point, and you know, you see it across the humanities and the arts, um, you know, uh, people who are planning the, the concert series and they, they realize all anybody wants to hear is Tchaikovsky or something, right? And you want to have these edgy new composers. How do you, how do you create a context in which people can, can appreciate yeah something more than what they already know, whether it's Rembrandt or whether it's, um, you know, uh, Descartes, right? So if you want to leave, you want to, you, you want to talk about another philosopher that they may not have heard about, then you've got to do some work in, in preparing that. So while keeping with my point of modesty, I do think there's a responsibility to, as it were, cultivate, and that's, that's sort of why this is an ongoing thing. You're cultivating an audience that's going to be in a position to appreciate more than they originally did, which is why sort of this public engagement, I think, needs to be very much a two-way, uh, a two-way street because you're creating the audience for the sorts of things that you want to talk about more. Yeah. Um, so very plastically, we lured our our uh, high school students with pizza, yeah. right. and then they get to touch a centuries-old book, and I thought, wow, is that old? And they ask, how expensive is it? Well, yeah. the, and the curator said, <laughs> well, you could buy a nice house. So, and they were like, what? Super and impressive. posting it on their social media. So you can, you know, you can, you can but also. But that is marketing as well, right? Well, it's, it's a thin line between yeah. like marketing and, and science communication, I guess. Well, we could learn from marketing oh, doing right. science communication, I think. But the question is also what the goal what the goal is here. I mean, is the goal that people are really kind of excited about the topic? That's that seems an important goal. <laughs> you know, a lot would have been achieved if we if we get to that. Um, there's also there's also a goal of informing, educating, advising people outside the academy. So that, so that there's sort of and that's where that's where the, the the natural sciences, the life sciences, you know, have an have an edge. They've got like concrete solutions to concrete uh, uh, problems. But there's also, I think, this, this notion, I'm fascinated with the, idea, with the parallels in philosophy and ethics with citizen science. And I'd like to actually, this has very, very much inspired me to start thinking a bit more what that, what that would mean. But creating these contexts in which there's, there's a kind of collaboration going on seems really important. I just want to emphasize this, this idea of, of interaction. So public engagement is not just about sending. Yeah. It's about mm -hmm. asking, so what are the questions that you are curious about asking the public? Because then automatically you get that collaboration going, you get that re trust, you know, results from that, and you also get that sustainable relationship. So that it doesn't end, you know, once your project is done, but you have a durable relationship. It was also, you know, something you talked about. So I think that's very important. And it's durable not just between you and the, the wider public, but it's also durable in the sense of being sustainable as a researcher. Um, I have a, my colleague, uh, Rutger Klaas, uh, developed when we were having these discussions within the Ethics Institute of how to think about outreach and social impact and public engagement. And he developed what we've come to call the wheel of outreach, which wow. involves, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a researcher, you're developing ideas of your own. Then you look for a context like this one, where you sort of present in a more accessible form some of the ideas, or you lure people into some uh, <laughs> with pizza. Pizza always helps. Um, and but then the the wheel keeps turning in the sense that you you don't yet have a partner in that moment, right? And I didn't have one here. Um, I was just giving a Studium Generale uh, lecture about uh, Uitstelgedrag. Just, just, just. It was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, the room was packed. You, you can't. There was it was standing room only. It was really it was really pretty yeah. fun. Uh, and but so that's the second stage. You know, you do your own research, then then you present it to a wider audience, and then there are people who kind of pick up on that and they say, Hey, 
um, that's interesting. That might have some connection with what what I'm doing. And then you, whether you have coffee or whether you have you know sort of initial workshop where you involve some societal partners uh, about about something. And that happened with this. There was a former student of mine who came up afterwards, and he said. Uh, wow, I haven't really thought about this way, but when you were talking about time perspectives of people who struggle with procrastination, that reminded me exactly of what I'm working with, with the homeless in Utrecht. He works for the Gemeente now, and he was looking for ways to reduce the recidivism, so sort of people who get housing and then they fall back into being homeless. And he was saying, there's something about their time perspective. Well, we then developed a, a, a project proposal to get together with, um, with some people from uh, Leger des Heils and, and other groups and, and the Hochschool Utrecht to, um, to look into this and, and try, and there's a, there's a group of students who then also developed some designs of VR glasses and so on for how they could think about imagining yourself in the future and so on. And, and that led to, um, to a, a poster presentation at a conference that this former student and I did, and now I'm thinking in new ways, and that's where the, that's where the wheel keeps turning. I'm thinking in new ways in my own research about how to incorporate some of these some of these uh, perspectives that I would never have I never would have started thinking about the sort of the spatial character of imagining your future self that's so central to people struggling with being uh, homeless. What do you think about this wheel of, of engagement? Well, uh, that wheel of engagement, um, I see it in a smaller scale in my project because we're constantly testing and looking for the questions that, that uh, the teachers and the, the students find interesting. Yeah. So it's never about what, what I find interesting, it's what, what would they would like to learn. So that wheel is going on, and in the same time, for me as a, as a researcher, and I have ideas about interdisciplinary um, uh, 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 collaboration, I have ideas about, you know, I'm a medievalist, so I, I am in a field where a lot of people collaborate with each other, but I'm seeing new ways, for example, working with Doyle, with the design agency, who bring a whole different type of development, so the design thinking that I, I never knew about, but now if I have to, to write a paper somewhere, I think, I will, I will make it a design thinking session with myself. Exactly. You know, so it's, it's also training me to think differently about these things and to step out of my comfort zone and force myself to, uh, to tackle things another way around. So in that way, you could see the wheel is, yeah. Yeah, the wheel is turning. Yeah. I'm a big sci-fi fan, so I love the wheel. <laughs> Or maybe so not yeah. even just a wheel, but I'm also thinking of like an oil, but an oil, an oily flick. Like a yeah. you start somewhere, and then your project de project develops, and people hear about it, and they come up to you. It's bottom up. Mm -hmm. I had a poet coming up to me say, "Oh, I read about your project. What I would like to do is to make a chain of poems along the lime, starting with one line, and at the next fortress, another line will be added." So this is someone just presented to me, you know. Like I want to do this. I was like, yes, please come on board. This is fantastic. And so you know, I yep. see the wheel, but I also see another kind of uh, figure, you know, developing from the uh, the project. Well, and the fun thing is that that what we see when we are talking with uh, with teachers. So the the teachers working on the pre science level, they all know their projects. You know, they have projects. They work with scientists. They speak with scientists. They have a professor in the class. Stuff uh, stuff mm. like that. So they they but. The, the the VMBO teachers, they say, we don't have this yet. This is so cool. Can we think? Can we can we cooperate? Can we help? So, and during our um, um, problem session in the design thinking, we also talked with a teacher who was in the special education, and and we um, we didn't know that. So he was you know he he was he was there and saying, well oh oh I'm doing special education, so maybe I'm not a, the person you need to talk with, and afterwards, he was totally enthusiastic. He said, this is for my students. You know, it's with tech stuff, they like that. They have to collaborate, that's in, in a very, you know, structured way. It's our struct, the, the challenges that they have to solve are very structured. So this is perfect for my kids. And and that was something that we, um, uh, that, that we, weren't expecting, you know, we were thinking, okay, we, we're doing VWO and maybe uh, VMBO, and in the end, you have an entirely uh, new group of, of kids who, who 
never see a scientist in the wild, mm. that th that you can reach this way. Yeah, so it's also about constantly adapting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Um, so my question is, uh, what I hear a lot in uh, public engagement with uh, research and now citizen science as it uh, seems, there is a lot of um, things that keeps coming up that are interesting and probably will end up being bigger projects. How do you keep focused as a researcher and also keep your audience focused to uh, the objectives of the original uh, goal, of the original project, and also keep them at the same time motivated to go to the next stage, uh, but in a very st structured or fruitful way? Hmm. <laughs> You're asking me? Or, uh, yeah, or anyone? <laughs> 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 shall, I shall I start? Yeah. So we have a very strict planning with moments of uh, evaluation in it, and we're constantly, we're in a, in a consortium with the university and with the Royal Library and with the, with the designing uh, agency. So we made a very strict planning for ourselves and we're constantly going forward and backward, so constantly monitoring. So we have a very thorough administration system um, um, which takes a bit of time, but also uh, allows you to keep track of what you are doing. And I find it that when you're working, for example, with the Royal Library, they, they, have, um, um, uh, they have a project coordinator who is coordinating the whole thing, which is amazing because she, she's there to see if we are still on the right path. So um, that helps me because I would have lost track long ago, I think, if I were on my but own. But if you don't have that luxury, <laughs> 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 then, uh, I mean, it really is, it, it, I think it's, it's a great question because it's an important task of maintaining a focus, right? I mean, sometimes you have somebody who says, hey, I'd like to do this, and you can just say, okay, whatever, go, you know? Uh, you don't really need even my permission, or if you need it, you've got it. But in other times, the, the ongoing collaboration, you can get a bit of mission creep and you're expected to be involved in all these different things. And then we come back to the Tchaikovsky uh, point, right? There are certain things that are popular and, and that people want to work on more. I imagine this is also true with the archeological digs. There are certain things that theoretical archeologists are, I've, actually I have a course in graduate school on philosophy of archeology span that I really liked. Um, so there are these really complicated issues and maybe most of the detectors, the amateur detectors, are mostly interested in finding cool coins, right? And then you, there's some negotiation to do there. And there, I think that's why you've got to be thinking not just about how you can you know, get people excited about the things that they think they're looking for, but also help to shape their interests in aspects of your expertise that they may not have been aware of. I mean, I think it's, there's a close parallel with relationships, right? I mean, <laughs> they, did, they, did, they were maybe looking for what you have to offer, but you need to convince them that, that some of the things that you have are actually quite interesting to them. So I think it's hard work. It's hard work, but it's important to keep that focus because otherwise you just get pulled in so many different directions. And you know, we don't have the research time at our disposal to do all of that but and if i can just quickly add to that it, it, it takes a lot of time and you don't always have time for it so you, sometimes it's weekends sometimes it's evenings because but something i'm so excited about and, and really get energy from it's you know why you do it anyway um and i think what you said about involving um for example a citizen scientist explaining why it is important that they use that database but why, why mm. they add their finds to that database also makes a big difference because otherwise it's just, oh, I found a great coin. Well, you know, that's great for your own collection. But if they understand how they can contribute to this research. But that's cool for them too, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then show that appreciation. That's also yeah. important. So, you know, I love going out there and, and talking to people and giving lectures. Yet another one. And then Lara, my project manager, says, no, Saskia, it's, you have enough on your plate already. Don't <laughs> do this once. I told her to tell me that every now and then. Uh, because otherwise, you know, it just explodes. And I love that, but you know, there are limits. So uh, Maybe one other thing on this point, it's a matter of focusing your energies. It's also sometimes about keeping to certain standards. Um, I mean, you just need to be frank about that. 
much of the work that we do as as researchers, it is at, is at a sophisticated uh, level that it's taken a very long time to get to the point to be able to understand and appreciate. And I think we do need to keep in mind that you need to spend most of your time as a researcher uh, at that at that level. And um, while it's important, I learn a lot in teaching and in public engagement in making my ideas clear enough so that people without a lot of background can understand them. Uh, even so, I think you want to you want to keep in mind how the wheel turns in terms of going back to a point where in your journal publications you're also getting some some input out of this. I think that's that's when it's most sustainable for researchers. I think that's uh, that's a lot to. Uh, we have Frank Miedema. Oh yes, okay, right. So one, one <laughs> Mr. last Open Science. question before we go to uh, to the break. Yeah. Yes, because there, there are also people going to watch from uh, from home, so we we need it. Oh, you need it. Yeah, this brings to us to a very interesting point: standards, sophistication. Uh, did you say journal papers there, Joel? I did. That was, what is that? And uh, so my question is. What type of products are you producing? Is it are you still thinking about sophisticated papers for journals? Is that the only thing that the humanities can count no. or read? Uh, do they read it? And so I think this is of course not cynical. This is really other other products, other other types of, of outputs, academic outputs may seem less sophisticated, but can be very sophisticated. Podcasts, whatever. One of you, not not jo not Joel. He talks a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies. <laughs> So that's an interesting question because um, I, th I think we as a university have a problem with this. So I am doing all of this project that I'm doing in my free time because I am a docent and I do not have a research position at Utrecht University. I was sending in my NWO um, a proposal for the science communication and I got a message back. Sorry, you cannot be the pen folder because you don't have a you don't have a position. So someone else had to send it in under his name with the promise that we will turn it back as soon as all things are uh, set in place. And I'm not saying this because um, I want to uh, put attention to my particular position, but this is a university-wide problem. So we're doing it in our free time. We are not being able to um, to get money for it if we have if we don't have the the uh, specific background, and the problem is does the output count? So we will be making a game, uh, a very um, how do you say it, a very concrete thing that yeah. will be played by ten thousand uh, kids in three in three years. But how are we going to count that? I think you, you want to respond to yeah, that. So this, this is the other. So it's it, it's in fact the other way around. So because you are not producing the classical output. You're not considered uh, doing real science, not even by Joe Anderson probably. And and no, I was I was kidding. And uh, and so you're not uh, you're not say living up to the dreams of an academic in that field. And therefore you have to do it on Sunday afternoon and on Saturday. So but it's it starts with what is being rewarded and recognized. And that's changing. And we are As trying to change it. But but you also have to show that there are other products. There can be podcasts. There can be exhibitions. There can be. Uh, and the other question is, and then I stop. Are you also taking, say, people from outside of academia as an author on your papers, Joel? Yes. Yes. 